It's here, an object 10,000 times more powerful than anything we've ever tracked. It just entered our solar system. And it's not drifting. It's not tumbling. It's locking on to 3i Atlas, September 12th, 2025. The sky changes. The swan instrument flashes a silent warning. A tail, five times the width of a full moon, ignites the dark. A brightness not seen since hale -Bop, or maybe ever. And then another, 3i Atlas, already inbound, already under observation, already breaking the rules of what a comet should be. Two objects, opposite vectors, same destination, same week. They're not just arriving, they're converging. And the closer they get, the harder it is to believe this is natural. On September 12, 2025, astronomers monitoring the SWAN instrument aboard the SOHO spacecraft detected something that instantly broke protocol. A bright, fast-moving object was cutting across the sky. It wasn't subtle. Its tail stretched across two and a half degrees of sky, which, for scale, is about five times wider than the full moon. That kind of scale hadn't been seen in decades. In hours, data poured in. The object was rapidly designated C-2025 R2, SWAN. Initial magnitude readings put it at 7.4, already within range of binoculars and small telescopes. Amateur astronomers confirmed it almost immediately. Images started circulating online. In one case, the object's tail nearly overflowed the camera's field of view. Something that big, that bright, moving that fast, it stood out. The International Astronomical Union moved quickly to assign the name, and the professional astronomy community locked on. But the numbers didn't make sense. Most comets discovered in the modern era are faint. They appear as dim smudges that need powerful optics and long exposures just to be noticed. Swan was the opposite. It demanded attention. It was already lighting up the constellation Virgo and growing brighter by the day. By September 13th, both professionals and amateurs were reporting a steep increase in brightness, along with structural complexity in the tail. It wasn't just long, it was layered, sharp, and dynamic. The object wasn't shedding material randomly. It was directional, focused. The sheer luminosity caused immediate speculation. Was this a fragment of something larger? A particularly volatile comet from the Oort cloud? A previously unknown object kicked into the inner system by a gravitational interaction? None of the usual answers worked. This wasn't typical comet behavior. And the more it was tracked, the less natural it looked. Its brightness curve was smooth and consistent, but too steep. It wasn't behaving like a dusty body that brightens slowly under solar heating. It brightened fast, almost mechanically, and its trajectory? Not a casual entry. It was coming in at a steep 60-degree angle to the ecliptic, a highly inclined orbit that didn't align with most long-period comets. It was cutting through the inner system like it had a schedule to keep. Spectrographs added more fuel to the mystery. The core reflected light differently than expected. Most comets have a dusty surface that scatters sunlight in predictable ways. Diffuse, non-metallic, but SWAN returned sharp metallic readings. Some amateur spectroscopists noted spikes consistent with nickel or cobalt, metals used on Earth for their durability and heat resistance. The phrase nickel-cobalt hull started circulating in forums and podcasts. At this point, the conversation began shifting. Not just, what is this? But why is it here now? That's when comparisons started popping up, most notably to C-1995-01. Hale Bob, and even further back to the Great Comet of 1811, both of which became cultural events due to their brightness and visibility. But Swan wasn't just matching them, it was poised to surpass them. The amateur astronomy community began logging every change. Nightly updates were posted online. Brightness shifts, tail movement, halo formation. The tail wasn't a passive trail of ice and dust, it was reacting. Some even noticed what looked like microbursts, rhythmic flickers of light at the base of the tail, which could be interpreted as bursts of material or directional emissions. By the end of the week, Swan's orbit had been modeled with increasing precision. Its perihelion, the closest point to the sun, was projected to fall on October 20th 
at a solar distance of about 150 million kilometers. That's roughly Earth's distance from the Sun, a close pass, in astronomical terms. But more surprising than the orbit was its period. Based on its path, Swan would not return to the inner solar system for another 22,554 years, a timeline that predates recorded human history. The last time it would have passed by Earth was during the Ice Age, when humans were carving symbols into stone and building the earliest known structures. This raised the stakes. If Swan was just a comet, it was a once-in-a-civilization event. But if it was something more, something controlled, then it was on a long, deliberate journey. And it was arriving now for a reason. Discussion quickly turned speculative. Some astronomers urged caution. Spectral anomalies can be caused by instrument error or interference. Brightness spikes can be the result of surface fractures or sudden outgassing. But even with conservative assumptions, the numbers didn't line up. Its energy output, if calculated based on tail velocity and brightness, would be in the terawatt range. That's not just unusual. That's impossible for an object made of ice and rock. And yet, there it was, night after night, growing brighter, clearer, more structured. Its core wasn't breaking apart. Its tail wasn't chaotic. It was holding together, moving fast, and doing so with precision. Then came the reports of a silvery halo, not just glow, structure, a persistent, symmetrical envelope that tracked the object's movement and shifted intensity as it approached the sun. To some, it looked like a magnetic or plasma shield, not something we've ever seen on a comet before, not even something predicted by most models. Still, without close-range imaging, all anyone could do was guess, but those guesses were getting louder. The timing was what finally tipped the conversation into the fringe. Swan's discovery came just days after the reappearance of another object, 3i Atlas, on approach from a completely different part of the sky. Two unrelated bodies, both on steeply inclined orbits, both set to reach perihelion within the same 10-day window. The geometry was improbable. Their distances to the sun within 50 million kilometers of each other, closer than Mars ever gets to Earth. Some dismissed it. Cosmic coincidence? Others called it a corridor, a narrow path in space and time that both objects happened to occupy together. But when you're dealing with an object like Swan, massive, bright, and possibly engineered, coincidence becomes harder to defend. And as both objects approach their closest point to the sun, the worst case scenario began to unfold because no one would be able to watch them. From October 8th to 18th, ground-based observatories would go dark due to solar conjunction, a time when the sun blocks our view of anything near it in the sky. And Swan was heading straight into that window. So was 3i Atlas, two objects, both anomalous, both converging, and both slipping into a window where Earth's most powerful telescopes would be useless and behind that blackout, they would pass, or meet, or merge. Nobody knew, and officially, nobody was allowed to ask. The deeper you looked into Swan, the less it looked like an accident, and more like a decision. There are accidents, and then there are alignments so precise, they feel scripted. Swan is not alone. Just days before it appeared, another object, 3i Atlas, was already inbound, already under scrutiny, already making scientists nervous. It came from Sagittarius, Swan from Aquarius. Their approach vectors separated by over a quarter of the sky, different angles, different speeds, different origins. And yet, both will reach perihelion, their closest point to the sun, within a 10-day window, Swan. October 20th, at 150 million kilometers. 3i Atlas, October 17th, at 203 million kilometers. That's closer than Mars ever gets to Earth. Two unrelated objects, two massive bodies on two extreme orbits. And yet, here they are. Skimming past the sun together, astronomers call it a corridor, a narrow path in space and time. And both objects have entered it, but it gets worse because the moment they arrive, we go blind. From October 8th to 18th, 
Earth's telescopes are effectively shut down. The sun's glare blocks direct observation. We call it solar conjunction, a normal part of astronomy. But this time, it's not just inconvenient, it's surgical. The blackout window perfectly overlaps the most critical moment, the convergence. No Hubble, no web, no ground-based arrays, just radio silence. And not just because of physics. Leaked memos from observatories mentioned something more, something off the record. Official requests for data were denied. Radar imaging was suspended. Observation proposals marked as classified. Public statements discouraged. This isn't just a solar gap. It's a silence by design. Theories erupted. A power source too dangerous to reveal. A rendezvous meant to happen unseen. Or worse, a mission we were never meant to observe. Because the orbital math doesn't lie. Swan and Atlas are not on similar paths. One cut steeply, over 60 degrees off the ecliptic. The other, almost perpendicular. And yet, they'll meet the sun almost side by side, as if drawn to the same point, at the same moment, as if summoned. That's what no one can explain. Statistically, these orbits should miss each other by centuries. The timing should be random. The distances, scattered point three. The angles, meaningless. But they're not. They're aligned. And the sun is the focal point. Think about that. A 22,554-year orbit. A hyperbolic interstellar trajectory. Both arriving now. Both hidden together. Both locked out of public view. Coincidence? Or choreography? Some call it cosmic timing. Others call it maneuvering. Because when two objects cross a gravitational corridor this precisely, and do it behind the only light source that blinds our instruments, you have to ask, who's hiding what? And why now? We wanted to believe they were just comets. Simple, natural, predictable. But nature doesn't steer. It doesn't modulate thrust. And it doesn't hide behind the sun. Because what we're seeing now doesn't behave like ice and dust. It behaves like hardware. Let's start with 3i Atlas, the quieter of the two. From a distance, it looked harmless. Another long period object slipping through the system. But then the data came in a nickel-dominated body with almost no iron. Not how comets work. Then, CO2. Atlas emits carbon dioxide at five times the rate of water vapor. That's not comet behavior. And then came the pulses. Three sharp accelerations, two weeks apart, each paired with a color shift from red to neutral and back. Spikes in motion, as if Atlas fired a thruster. 10 gigawatts of energy from a comet number, from a drone, and it wasn't just the motion. Each pulse was tied to a shift in its tail composition. CO2 concentrations fluctuated in lockstep with velocity changes, a pattern some spectroscopists called thrust mix modulation. This is not passive outgassing. This is targeted propulsion, designed, controlled, executed, now swan. Swan is something else entirely. A fortress, nickel cobalt alloy, metallic reflectance, a silvery envelope that behaves like a shield. Its tail, rhythmic plasma bursts, tiny course corrections, micro thrust pulses that repeat, and the power estimate, 10,000 gigawatts, more than Earth's entire output. It reflects like metal, moves like a machine, endures solar radiation like it was made to. Most comets disintegrate as they approach perihelion. Swan got stronger. Its tail expanded. Its trajectory sharpened. Its reflective index spiked. And then came the optical anomaly. A persistent halo around its nucleus. Not ice. Not gas. Something electromagnetic. A plasma envelope shielding it from solar wind. Maintaining integrity. Absorbing radiation and debris like armor. Some called it nickel cobalt hull. Others said it looked like a ship. But what matters is not the name. It's the behavior, course corrections, pulsed acceleration, stable reflectance across solar vectors, 
Swan wasn't reacting. It was navigating, and it was converging, right into the blackout corridor, together with 3i Atlas. Some speculate it was a refueling event, using solar energy as a pit stop, or a data transfer. Others suggest a recovery mission to intercept something that malfunctioned, or worse, a pursuit. Because 3i Atlas didn't just appear first, it changed course twice, each time more aligned with Swan's incoming vector, and each change followed by that same thrust signature. If these are probes, this is rendezvous. If they're enemies, this is interception. If they're parts of something larger, then this is just phase one. Some point to Oumuamua, first strange visitor, then 3i Atlas, now Swan, each more advanced, each more active, each closer, like stages in a long observation or an audit chain. If that's true, the next arrival won't pass through, it will land. And what happens after that isn't science fiction anymore? What if this was never about discovery? What if what we saw wasn't meant to be seen? Two objects, one emitting controlled pulses, one armored against the sun itself, crossing the inner solar system like they knew the way, crossing each other's paths in silence. And then they vanished behind the solar curtain, gone not just from sight, but from certainty. We were told to stop watching, told the sun made it impossible, but people watched anyway, from backyards, from hilltops, from makeshift networks and dusty observatories. And what they found was not chaos, not randomness, but rhythm, pulses, bursts, alignments, patterns that don't emerge from nature, patterns that suggest intention. Some say this was a fuel stop. Others say it was surveillance. Some whisper of ancient cycles, of objects that return every 22,000 years, like a pendulum with memory. SWAN's orbit links it to the last ice age, to a time when humans were building their first monuments. Coincidence or continuity? The truth is, we don't know. But we do know this. When the skies went dark, they moved. And when we looked again, they were gone. This wasn't noise. It was a signal, a whisper across centuries, a maneuver seen once, maybe twice in a thousand lifetimes. And maybe we weren't supposed to catch it, but we did. And now we have to ask, what comes next? If this was contact, it was subtle. If this was surveillance, it was surgical. And if it was a warning, we just missed it. So stay awake, stay watching, stay wondering, because one day the sky will move again. And when it does, you'll want to remember this moment because the next object might not pass by. It might stay and it might not come alone. Subscribe, share, leave your trace in the silence. We're not just watching the unknown anymore. We're part of it.